Welcome to 2819. I'm Sandra Dimez. Brian Rohnbacher can't be with us today, so I'm going to go ahead and give a rundown of what we're doing on today's episode. In RTB 101, we're going to be hearing from apologist Abdu Murray on the question, what does salvation look like in Christianity as compared to Islam? In Give and Take, Jeff Zwering will be interviewing theologian Ken Keithley about if Genesis borrowed from ancient myths. But first up, I'm going to be talking with philosopher George Haraxon, and we'll be reflecting on the tragedy of 9-11. Can you believe it's been 20 years already? Let's check it out. Now it's time for Culture Talk, where we discuss culturally relevant topics that you can use to start conversations about your faith. I'm joined today with George Raxon. You are a professor of philosophy and ethics, mm -hmm. and you're also a former pastor. Yep. And were you, well, we're going to be talking about the 20th anniversary mm. of 9 11. My question, my first two questions are first, were you a pastor when? Yes. Okay. All right. So you're yeah. coming with that perspective. The question everybody asks whenever something like mm. this significant happens is where were you? So where were you on 9 11? Yeah. Well, I had had some church meetings the night before that mm. went really late. Mm. So actually, I was sleeping in, oh, God. and my wife came over and mm -hmm. woke me up and said, do, do you know what's going on? And mm. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. And she came out because someone had called her because mm. we didn't have the we didn't have the TV on or anything like that. Right. And that's when we discovered all that was going wow. on. And then I started immediately getting calls from people at church. and. And, and, that. and I had a friend who lived in New York at the time, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and he, you know, sent me this picture right around uh, a little bit after that time. Wow! That so, I came to my office. What were your initial thoughts as all of this was unfolding? Or I'm not sure. Maybe it unfolded by the time you woke up. But what were your initial thoughts? Well, in, in some respects, that the world has changed. Right. You know. Yeah. Um, and we aren't as used to it, at least in the North American context, mm -hmm. to have such threats, you know, on our soil. I had mm -hmm. had traveled to many other places in the world, particularly I was in Romania in 91, and there was a coup that happened in Russia, and I saw all the Romanians get nervous because they were worried about, you know, communism coming back into their country and things like that. And mm -hmm. so I, they lived with that kind of fear, if you yeah. might say, um, we weren't used to living quite that in that way. Right. So I, it's hard to believe that it's it's been 20 years, mm -hmm. but looking back now, like what sort of conversations might you have, because this is going to be coming up. Sure. What sort of conversations might you have, um, particularly as you're engaging with those who might say, you know, this is a 9-11 is a reason why religion is problematic. Mm. Um, how do you respond to that from a Christian perspective? Well, Christianity predicts that human beings are a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we might ask, you know, why does God permit such evils? Mm -hmm. But you could flip that question a little bit, and there's a prior question, why do human beings, um, you know, act out such so much evil in the mm -hmm. world. And a question I like to ask people in in a situation like this is, do you think people are basically good or do you think they're basically flawed mm -hmm. or bad? Which which is more stronger? And I even ask this of students in my class, and it's interesting how many will say that people are basically good. Yeah. And then I'll ask, well, then why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? And then we get to get into a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I think that is um, a really good question that people are going to be asking. And you and I actually recorded mm. um, a previous 2019 segment, so people can look for that too, or talk about why mm. God would allow evil and suffering. It is really such a, a, a deep question. But you know what? When we talk about whether humans are more like evil or they're kind of good, I think what we get from events like 9-11 is kind of seeing both. Like, would mm. you say that we saw some, some like we talk about the beauty and the wretchedness, mm. is it Augustine who says that, or Pascal? Yeah. Well, Pascal talked about it, right. yeah, most certainly, yeah. And, and so we saw that, mm -hmm. um, and how would you kind of bring that into the conversation? Yeah, just a personal story. I, I stood on the two towers, on one of the towers that year. So mm -hmm. it was fresh within my memory. And what you 
what you kind of glean is that human beings are capable of so much beauty, such right. amazing feats. It really does separate us from the animal kingdom. Right. But as you say, at the same time, we can be so wretched right. and uh, depraved. And looking at both of those, I think looking back on the event, you are correct, we saw both things. Mm -hmm. The question then kind of becomes is, well, how do you make good people, mm -hmm. right? How do we, if we want to avoid things like this, what is a good person and how do we, how do we make, cultivate good people? And mm -hmm. this, of course, is an, uh, uh, something that Jesus picks up uh, directly in the Sermon mm -hmm. on the Mount. So now here's my, my question about that. If we talk about Sermon on the Mount and this is how we make people good, mm -hmm. how do we explain that from a non-Christian perspective or can we? Like where would, where would that goodness come from? Yeah, I mean, certainly there have been uh, non or non-Christian thinkers like mm -hmm. Aristotle, for instance, right. who has talked about, well, what is a good person, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of like asking, well, what's a good flower? You just kind of mm -hmm. know it when you see it, right? Mm -hmm. And then you learn to imitate it, mm -hmm. pick up the habits, cultivate the right soil so that that good flower arises. So we can observe and look at what kind, what is a good person? Who would you point to? Mm -hmm. And then what is it about them that makes them good, right? What kind of habits do they have? What, um, you know, uh, for, the, for the Christian, Christians, we can't do it on our own, mm -hmm. that we need to be connected to something and that something is God yeah. in order for us to, to do that. So, you know, as we approach now this 20th commemoration or anniversary of 9-11, mm -hmm. some might say like, should we even be commemor commemorating such a day? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think having days like this, where, as you say, we look at both the beauty of human, human beings mm -hmm. to be good to others, but also the evil in human beings, mm -hmm. it's important to sit back and remember these kinds of events, mm -hmm. um, to think about these ultimate questions, these big questions of life. Mm -hmm. And because they're actually really practical questions. Yeah. What a good person is, how do we become a good person? And also, how do we relieve people of suffering in that. A big part of this uh, was helping people to um, overcome a very painful, evil event. Mm -hmm. And um, human beings, and, and God has actually a lot to say in the mm -hmm. Old and New Testament about remembering yeah. these things. It's a spiritual discipline. I think it's a moral discipline to do so. Yeah. Well, thank you so mm -hmm. much for that. And uh, thank you for just speaking on such an important topic. Yeah. If you would like to hear more from George Haraxon, go to reasons.org and search for George Haraxon. What is the best way to share the gospel with a Muslim? Well, I believe uh, something that is critical if we want to be effective in sharing the gospel is to understand the similarities and the differences between Islamic theology and Christian theology. And fortunately, I'm joined today by Abdu Murray, who's going to help us understand some of those differences. Uh, Abdu, you were a former Muslim and converted to Christianity. You now head up a ministry called Embrace the Truth International, a ministry devoted to sharing the truth of the gospel with non-believers, including Muslims. You have a BA in psychology and a doctor of jurisprudence from the University of Michigan. And uh, we've been talking a little bit about, again, some of the differences and the similarities between Christianity and Islam. One of those differences has to do with how we understand the means towards salvation. So help us understand the differences in, in how salvation is attained in Islam versus Christianity. Mm, well, this is, of course, the, the key issue because what's the point of being a Christian if there's nothing at the end of the road, so to speak, that tells us the meaning and purpose of our lives and Muslims have the same struggle with Islam as well. Um, uh, in, in, in Islam, salvation is by no means cer certain. It very much depends on who you are and your works. Um, now, that's always coupled with God's mercy. In fact, as I said before in a previous episode, one of the most common names for God is he's Ar-Rahim. He is the merciful one. Um, so his mercy is very important in Islam because we do mess up, either intentionally or unintentionally. And sin is a pretty serious issue uh, in Islam as well. So we need to make up for that sin. But we're the ones who do it. Uh, the Quran is specific about at the end of the t end of time, we will stand before God in judgment, and our scale, our, our sort of heavenly scale, will be weighed, and our good deeds must outweigh our bad deeds. For those whose scale is heavy on the good, 
heaven is their abode. And for those whose scale is light on the good, hell is where they're going. Um, but God, of course, can, because he has ultimate sovereignty, can decide, based on whatever he feels like, to send you to. Um, so there's no real certainty in Islam. Now, again, you have to earn it. You have to earn his mercy, which, of course, is a problem, because earning mercy is, is, is contradictory in some sense, because mercy is that which you don't deserve. But earning it means you do deserve it, so you can't have both. The difference, of course, in Christianity is that we recognize, like Muslims, that there is an inherent problem with humanity. There is a sin problem. Now, Muslims don't believe in, in original sin, but they do believe that human beings will act sinfully. They also say that there's no savior. There's no one who will save us from ourselves, uh, that we can be our own solution, so to speak. Christianity recognizes that if we're the problem, we can't be the solution. We're the problem. We need someone who's not us to save us from us. And that's who Christ actually is. He is the, the second person of the Trinity, who becomes incarnate in, in the Son of God, who is Jesus, who walks around uh, sharing a divine and human nature, who takes on the sin of the world, having no burdens of his own to bear. He bears them for us and pays the penalty that we simply cannot pay unless we want to end up separated from God. And he's the one who pays the penalty for us. So the differences are pretty stark. One is, it has to be a works-based system, and the other one is a grace-based system that says that someone else has done it for us. You know, I would think that this would be a very critical point of discussion when sharing the, the gospel with a, a Muslim. And the reason I say that is because my father was a Muslim, and I saw him die. I was by his bedside as he died, but I saw him die, um, um, again, as a Muslim and watched him go through a, a protracted decline in his health. And in the latter days of his life, he was absolutely agonized. And part of that was essentially my conversion to Christianity. I mean, he told me that my greatest failure as a father is that you converted to Christianity. Mm -hmm. And uh, and my mom would tell me that he would have these dreams where his father was coming to him and was angry with him because I converted to Christianity. But he was literally tortured uh, by that failing and I think was deeply concerned what was gonna be his fate as a result of that. Mm. And so I saw per firsthand just how that uncertainty pay plays out at, in the end of life. And um, I would think that this would be a very powerful uh, point to bring up with a Muslim, uh, not in, a, in an argumentative way, but really in a, in, a, in a pastoral way as you engage a Muslim. Absolutely, you know, that uncertainty, that can eat at you. Um, because all of us, you know, we all have issues that keep us awake at night, no matter how well we've lived our lives. There are some things that keep us awake at night. And that's why Jesus says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. There is a yoke and there is a burden, but it's light. And he's the one who takes it for us. And if that's the case, there's gotta be some measure of comfort there. There is the intellectual, but there's also the existential. And the existential part really is, what has God done for us? What is true mercy? What is utter and great and magnificent mercy? It is to take the burden from us, to have us pass into the next world knowing that we have that salvation because God is the only one who can provide it. And we can't, we know this empirically, we know this. It's interesting because when you look at um, uh, Imam Ali, Imam Ali was a, revered by Shiites all over the world, but also a very important figure throughout Islam. And he wrote a, a, a series of sermons and he makes an interesting statement. He says, among the believers there are three. There are those who worship God to attain his favor. That is the worship of the merchants. There are those who worship God to avoid his hell out of fear, and that is the worship of a slave. But there are those who worship God out of gratitude. That is the worship of free and noble men. Well, the third person is a, is a Christian. He didn't mean to say that, of course, but that's the reality, is that if we worship God out of a gratitude for the salvation that we have, all the good works we do, sure, we store up treasures for ourselves in heaven, but those are expressions or offerings to God in, in, in gratitude not so that we can get salvation, because we already have it. Hello, Jeff Zwerink here. Welcome to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas 
to help you be more convinced on the truth of Christianity. And today I'm joined by Dr. Ken Keithley, and we're going to be investigating whether the Bible, in particular Genesis, is just a, another copy of an ancient Near Eastern religious text. Ken, it's good to have you here today. Good to be here. Thank you, Jeff. Always excited to get to talk to someone who's got expertise, not only a you know, background in science, but also a good understanding of theology and ancient Near Eastern texts and bi biblical texts. And so kind of just maybe start us off here. What are the features of ancient Near Eastern texts? Uh, because we're going to be talking about whether Genesis is a copy of one of those that's out there. Yeah, well, <clears throat> we do recognize that Israel was surrounded by neighbors. Uh, there was you know, Babylon on one side, uh, there was Egypt on the other. And so there, and then of course, uh, even within the promised land, there were the Canaanites. So there were a lot of other uh, cultures surrounding Israel. And without a doubt, they had a profound influence on the way the people thought in that time. So yeah, uh, just like just like any other time, uh, uh, they were not they were not isolated, nor were they an island. So, I mean, it seems almost obvious that that would have some influence in going on there. And there, there are a lot of people who will just claim that the Bible, particularly uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that those are just copies of other ancient Near Eastern religious texts. Is the Bible just another copy of what was going on at the time? Uh, that's a very strange claim for someone to make. I don't know, uh, you know, reputable scholars who would say that the Bible is simply a copy. Um, I think what it would be a more accurate way to say is that it's very much in conversation with the cultures surrounding it. So what you find is, is yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of concept, there's a lot of terms, uh, there's a lot of ideas that uh, the biblical authors are interacting with, but that's not the same thing as a copy. Well, so okay, so maybe it's not a copy, but the, I think the claim I've heard is that the Bible is just plagiarizing from other ancient Near Eastern texts, and therefore it's really nothing special. It's just kind of the latest on the scene, if you will. Yeah, well, uh, think of it this way. Um, uh, there, there were plenty of, of competing creation myths. Uh, there were also other accounts that told about uh, certain significant historical events, such as the flood. Uh, the fact that, that, uh, that we find Babylonian accounts of the flood, and then we find that there are uh, Hebrew accounts of the flood, doesn't mean that one borrowed from the other. It means more than likely they're talking about the same event. So that seems to be a much more reasonable way to understanding that. Uh, I do think, though, that they engaged with one another, uh, that they uh, knew about each other's uh, way of thinking and their writing. So I, I do think that there's a bit of conversation going on, as I said before. So if, if they're both talking about the same things and, and there's a lot, I mean, the, the kind of the impression I get from that claim is, you know, that the Bible's just copying is like they really just look pretty similar. They're basically the same. And I know I've talked with you enough to know that, you when you you see the Genesis, particularly Genesis account, and you know, like the Enuma Elish, that they appear very different to you. Kind of give us explore that a little bit with us. Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah. They they may be talking about the same things, but they're coming at it from very very different perspectives. I think that comes through loud and clear. Uh, it one of the things that one cannot help but notice from the Bible is that there is a significant pushback, if you will, from the biblical authors towards the worldviews of the surrounding cultures. So they're engaging with the same events, they're engaging with the same ideas, but they're, come, they're, they're, they're arguing uh, very different points of view. Uh, so uh, whereas the other uh, competing narratives are presenting a plethora of deities, that are constantly at battle. And they, uh, what we find in the Bible is that there is one sovereign God who is creator of heavens and the earth. Uh, the other um, creation narratives present humans as slaves, beasts of burdens, uh, uh, creatures created to make life easier for uh, the gods. Uh, the Bible presents uh, man and woman as being created in God's image. 
as co-regents with him and commissioned uh, to, to have a, a royal role uh, in creation. So it's a, so dealing with a lot of the same things, very different viewpoint. So if, if they're dealing with a lot of the same, or I guess that, that idea that they have a very different viewpoint, if, uh, you know, there's one God as opposed to many gods, if there's humans are important and exceptional rather than being just slaves and servants of the gods, why are there so many of these common elements in there? Why does the Bible look so much like an ancient Near Eastern text? Well, because that's the time in which it lives. I mean, you think about the conversation we are having right now that somebody a couple of hundred years from now look back and they'll say they talked like someone at the beginning of the 21st century. Why did they do that? Well, that's the culture in which we live. It's, it's the time in which we live. The, the figures of speech, the expressions we use, the very questions. I mean, you think about it. You began uh, this uh, program by asking a pertinent question that is relevant today. Uh, so why should we be surprised? that the Bible addresses the questions of that day. And so it addresses the questions of that day, but it does so in such a way that not only does the answer relate to then, the answer is relevant for all ages. So what, one of the things that I find fascinating and, uh, you know, just this idea that, you know, Moses talking to his original audience there, it seems like the original audience thinks very differently than we do today. But yet when I read the Genesis account, it reads very much the way I think about things. It's like God did this, and then this happened, and this for this purpose. That's very much the language of today. Is that unique or exceptional? Yeah, I think what you're you're getting at, and this is a good point, and that is that or, the original audience of Genesis thought very much like the people surrounding them. Uh, and, and so what you have in the book of Genesis and, and the creation account in Genesis 1 and 2 is, is almost a work of evangelism because um, <clears throat> Moses is calling uh, the people to an entirely different way of understanding God, a different way of understanding creation, a different way of understanding their way, place in the world. And as, so, as he does... Um, he presents to them a worldview, as you say, one that has powerfully shaped you and me because it provides the basis for Western thought. Uh, rather than this being uh, a world made up of a plethora of deities in which reality is fractured into a thousand different pieces, we believe we're in a universe, uh, that there is one reality of which we live in it, uh, and the way we're and that we're able to actually understand it sufficiently. Where did all of these uh, ideas come from? I mean, that this is a very Western way of thinking. Well, it comes from the biblical worldview that's presented to us in the opening chapters of Genesis. Well, thanks, Dr. Keithley. Really appreciate your comments. And you know, I, I've heard this claim very often. You know, that that Genesis is just a copy or another one of those ancient Near Eastern texts. And when you really look into it, what you see is that Moses did such a phenomenal job of contextualizing his message that we think more like Moses than his original audience did. That's really yeah. a sign that the Bible is inspired by God for peoples of all time. And I would encourage you to go to uh, uh, YouTube and look for Ken's video on this. It's called Genesis Among Pagans. We'll give you some great insight into other ancient Near Eastern texts and how the Bible really is unique and authoritative and really has something to say that no other text does. Gives you great tools to go out and tell others about who God is, the creator that created you and me and us, and how we can know him. I hope this episode has helped equip you to share your faith with compassion and with confidence. Don't forget, subscribe to the show. So grab your phones right now. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at 2819show and let us know what you think and let us know if you have any ideas. And also, if you'd like to have the audio version, you can find us pretty much wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search Reasons to Believe Podcasts. We'll see you next week.